Baruchim Abayim, ladies. We're studying today Parashiyot, Achremot, and Kedoshim. Again, this is a double header week as we read two Parashiyot. We're not going to go in any, in any order because I'd like to start with something that's in Parashat Kedoshim but related to for the first parasha. There's a mitzvah in the Torah that says, Hocheyach tochiyach et amitecha. Torah demands us when we see something wrong and somebody making an avon, somebody doing some type of sin, the attitude of the Torah is that Jews must rebuke and Jews must make a stand in order to correct somebody for making a sin. It's not an attitude of live and let live and mind your own business and what are you getting involved for. That's an American attitude. But for our attitude is not like that. The question is why? What's the matter with minding your own business? If I want to do something that's not in accordance to the Torah, so leave me alone. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Don't tell me what to do. Don't we brag in America of freedoms, including freedom of religion? So therefore, what kind of law is this? And what's the logic that we have to go and see somebody doing something wrong and start giving them a tochaha, rebuke? So the famous example that's given to explain it, before we analyze it deeply, is some passages that were together on a cruise liner on a boat and one of the passengers was in his cabin and he was drilling a hole at the at the floor of his cabin and the people on the boat heard what he was doing they heard a drill they hear him making noise he's boring a hole in his cabin so they come knocking on the door hey buddy what are you doing stop making noise what's it your business what I'm doing it's my room here's my receipt I paid for it I can do whatever I want he said fool if you bore a hole into your and to your cabin floor, we're all going to drown. So it's our obligation to stop you. Forget about you. You can do whatever you want, but you're going to affect us. So the same thing when it comes to religion. Our rabbis tell us that the Jewish people are considered one unit. We're all one. And it's like one body. So if one part of the body is sick, or deficient, or problematic, the whole body, God forbid, suffers. So therefore you are affecting everybody else. Regarding the united soul of the Jewish people, it is affected by everybody else's sin. So therefore it's incumbent to rebuke, not only to cause that person to change his ways, but to save yourself. But the question is how to rebuke. (laughs) Unfortunately, most people don't know how to do this mitzvah. And that's why most people are exempt from rebuking. The Torah tells us, "Velo tisa alav het." Rebuke must be free, free from humiliation. Person cannot come in public and rebuke somebody for making an avera for doing something wrong. At the same time, you shamed him, you caused him to turn all colors, and then you come along in the name of religion. But I was rebuking him; I had to tell him. Torah says, "In that case, better keep quiet." Velo tisa alav het. Do not make a sin at the time of your rebuke. It has to be done privately. And even in privately, one has to measure the words that he uses. One has to be very careful, to be very soft, especially in our generation, which is a very sensitive generation, which is a generation that has a difficult time hearing rebuke on anything. Therefore, it has to be measured and calculated in order to reach the sensitivity of the person that's listening. So I once heard a thought, the Torah says, tisa alav chet. In your rebuke, don't make a sin when you're rebuking, as we explained it. But I heard another explanation. Tisa alav chet means, when you're rebuking, don't make the sin big. Don't elevate. Tisa can also mean to lift. Don't lift the sin up. Don't make the sin big. What does it mean? When you're rebuking, don't make the sin big. So I saw wonderful. A father or mother rebuking a child. The child is some mischievous in school. 
There's two ways the father and mother can go about it. You did such a terrible thing. What an avon you did. It's a catastrophe. It's the worst thing. I don't know how you did such an avla. How did you do such a travesty? What a big thing you did. When you elevate the sin and make the sin great, you make your child very small. Therefore the Torah says, don't make the sin great. Make the person great. When you rebuke your children, you're supposed to say, You? You're such a sadiq. You did such a thing. You know better. You do so well in school. Your teachers love you. We're so proud of you. You? The star student. The star child. You were able to do such a thing? So instead of walking away from the rebuke feeling crushed because you smashed him with such a great sin... Instead of walking away feeling as if he's worthless and if he's useless and you're only setting him up to make another sin. Because if I was able to make such a big sin, so I'm nothing. I'm only prepared to make other big sins. But if you tell the person that you're rebuking, you tell your Sadiq, you're great. Who would expect from you such a thing? Maybe from the other boys we expect it, but not from you. When you build up the person and you minimize the sin that was done, then already, not only did you give a rebuke, but you prepared the child going forward to be successful. Because the next time he'll contemplate sin, he'll think to himself, Anna, me, I'm going to make a sin? My mother, my father told me I'm too great for this. It's beneath my dignity to do such a thing. But if the child is told that the sin was great, the child becomes crushed. Don't make the sin humongous upon him. Elevate the person, not the iniquity. That being said, there is a famous story told on one of the masters that used to give rebuke, the Hafez Hayim. The story was told, and you probably heard it, but it's worth it to repeat such stories to drill in these lessons. A rabbi once got up in front of his congregation to tell a story about the Hafez Chaim and he said there's a story told that in the Hafez Chaim's yeshiva if you could believe this there was a boy that got caught smoking a cigarette on Shabbat Shema Yisrael Hafez Chaim's yeshiva was uh, the Harvard of yeshiva and over here there was a child that it seemed seemingly was influenced by the modern society of that time they got caught so the Hafez Chaim wanted to speak to him so the Hafez Sain calls him into his office. He says, and he told him something. And the kid came out, and from that day on, never smoked a cigarette on Shabbat for the rest of his life. Became a Shomer Shabbat, a religious man. So the rabbi says, I wish I would know what the Hafez Sain told this child, what told this boy. I mean, he, what, what type of magic did he tell him? What type of rebuke? If we'd only know what the Hafez Sain told him, we'd be able to market this rebuke. And now bring back all of B'nai Yisrael. How could he turn him around in such a small amount of time? From a Mechalel Shabbat in the Yeshiva to a Shomer Shabbat in one conversation? He said, but that's the story. At the end of the story, one of the people listening was an elderly man. The elderly man came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, I was that boy in the Yeshiva. I was the boy smoking. And let me tell you exactly what the Hafez Haim said to me on that day. So you'll know the story. He says, in truth, he said three words. He brought me into his office, and the Hafez Chaim was a short man. The student was towering over his rabbi, and he grabbed my hand, the hand that smoked the cigarette, and tears started to fall down his eyes. And he started to say as he was crying, Shabbos, Shabbos. Shabbos, three times. And the hot tears of the rabbi were penetrating on my hand. Just, and when I saw the sincerity of the rabbi, that was his whole rebuke. He was crying, meaning it bothered him. He didn't scream. He didn't call me names. He didn't threaten to throw me out of the yeshiva. When I saw the genuine sincerity of the rabbi, that it pained him, that it was coming out of love, it was coming out of concern. Those tears, he said, bore a hole through this. Oh, I said, how could this hand ever pick up a cigarette on Shabbat again? That's the way we rebuke people. It must come from love. 
It must come not that we're trying to show we're better than them, that we're trying to show we're holier than them. Look, you don't know, I know. It's supposed to be done in the most, the most innocent, the most, the most unassuming, inconspicuous, quiet way in order that the person receiving the rebuke walks away. Whether he listens or not is another story. But at least he walks away saying, I heard him. It's not that he did something that was against the halakha. It should be pointed out also that there was some people that felt rebuking is against is against what Hashem really wants. What was their logic? Their logic was like this. We read in many books that you're always supposed to look for the good in people. We overlook the bad. We don't try to find faults in people. Especially, they tell stories about the greatest rabbis that always used to find the positive in every Jew. One such rabbi was a rabbi called the Levi Yitzhak from Berdichev. The Levi Yitzhak never knew how to say a bad word about the most, the most evil Jew, the worst, a Jew that doesn't follow anything, non-observant. He once went on Tisha Av, the rabbi, and saw a Jew in a restaurant eating tarif. So the rabbi walked in and he says, uh, my friend, do you know today's Tisha Av is a fast day? You're not allowed to eat. He says, I know. He says, my friend, do you know what you're eating is not kosher? He says, I know. Such an arrogant fellow. And if Levi Yitzhak walks out of the restaurant and turns to God and says, Borei Olam, look how good your people are. Even a fellow that eats pig on Tisha Av won't tell a lie. So you see over here, these rabbis would never talk prosecution against the Jewish people. So then the rabbi asked the question, so make up your mind, are you supposed to rebuke people to point out their faults? Or are you supposed to overlook it and make a guy eating on Tisha Av? As we say, he tells the truth. How do you work? How do you balance both traits? Are we supposed to talk good about the Jews? No one sees good. Or are we supposed to rebuke? So I saw a thought from Rav Zalman Sarutskin. He says like this. He says, we could learn the lesson from the Kohen Gadol on Kippur, which we read in the first parasha. In the first parasha today, we read of the Kohen Gadol that he used to wear when he used to walk into the Holy of Holies on Kippur, he used to wear white clothes. All white. Normally the Kohen Gadol would wear clothes that had some gold in it. But on Kippur, when he was inside the Holy of Holies talking to God, they did not want him to have any gold on him. Why? Not to remind God of the sin of the Jewish people of the golden calf. So you see, even the Kohen was sensitive not to remind God of the evil of the Jewish people. So he changed his garments in order to be all white, clean, no gold. But at the same time, he says, when he left the Kodesh Kodeshim, he put on the garments that had the gold on it. And he stood in front of the people. What do you mean? I thought you don't want to remind God. The explanation is as follows. When you're in front of the people, you rebuke them. You put on the gold in order they should remember. Look what you did. You did an egg. You worshipped the gold. How did you do it? But when you're in front of God, and you're not in front of the people, then you only talk good about the Jewish God. They didn't know. It's not their fault. So there is a balance. Certainly, the Levi Yitzhak went into the restaurant to rebuke the man. You're eating at the Shabbat. What are you doing? It's not cool. He rebuked him. He gave him uh, the Tokaha. But when he left, and now he was addressing his comments to God. God, please, they don't know better. Chazaton, they're simple, they didn't learn, they didn't go to yeshiva. That's between you and God. But between you and man, you have to point out the faults. The Kohen Gadol, when he was standing in the Azara, in the courtyard in front of the people, he put on the gold. Let them see the gold. Let them feel bad that they made the Avon of the Egel. But when he went in to talk to God in privacy in the Holy of Holies, then he put on his white garments. In order to tell Borei Olam, please, it's not their fault. They didn't know what to do with all that money. It was a, they fell into a lot of money. It happens to people. They get spoiled very quick. So on and so forth. So there is a balance not to talk prosecution against Jews in private. So that continues in Perashat Acharemot and tells us that after the Kohen Gadol would come out of the Holy of Holies, he'd take off his garments 
sham. He leaves them there. He put them in a box and leave them there forever. Once he wore the clothes on Kippur, he was not able to wear them a second time. Why? Rabbis explained, because he only went into the Holy of Holies once. And there's nothing higher than the Holy of Holies. So once these garments went into the Holy of Holies, you can't wear them outside now doing uh, less holy work. So what are you going to do with them? You can't throw them out. They're Kodesh. So what do they do? It says, Ve'niham Sham. They folded them up, they go in, put them in a box. So Rabbi Giftal of Shalom asks the question. He says, I understand he can't wear these exact garments during the year because he's doing less holy work. But why can't he wear it next Kippur? Next Kippur, let him take it out of the box. When he goes into the Holy of Holies again, put the same garments on and walk in. It's the same level. A strong question. So Rabbi Giftal says an answer that is the essence of human nature. Human nature is as such that the more we do something over and over again, the more mechanical it gets, and the more routine it gets, and we start to do it without kavana, without intent, without... It's like a boy that puts his tefillin on for the first time, oh, what an excitement he has. You see the kids when they just get bar mitzvah, you see them counting the straps... Moving them, making sure they don't touch each other, and they're constantly looking in the mirror to see it's scented, and they're playing with it. And look at a guy who's putting on Tiffany for 50 years, look how he puts it, he puts it on in his sleep, President K, he doesn't count, doesn't look, what happened? He got used to it already, it became another chore, it became another habit. So, doing things over and over again can breed this problem of lack of thought, of doing things by rote, of doing things just by second nature. And that's not good in religion. Religion needs concentration. So look how sensitive the Torah is. The Torah says, we want the Kohen Gadol to go into the Holy of Holies only once a year. On Kippur. Because we want it to be special. We don't want it to get used to walking into the Holy of Holies. So we want it to become an event where the Kohen Gadol will be excited, he'll be thinking about it with all the Kavanot. But what would happen if the second year he'd wear the same clothes that he wore the first year? Even though he's excited to go in and he hasn't been in there since a year. But if he would put on the same garments, the rabbi says he'd feel some degree of routine. I wore these clothes already. Already we did this once before. And that degree of routine of doing the same thing twice would affect the sensitive kavanot that the Kohen Gadol would need. Therefore the Torah says, don't wear them twice. Put them in the box. Next year, start fresh again. A great lesson in religion to try to figure out ways in order to rejuvenate the laws that we're following on a constant basis. A lady that lights candles once a week might get into the habit of 18 minutes, lighting a candle, and she might forget the importance of what she's doing. The only way to rejuvenate the sensitivity to mitzvot, our rabbis taught us, is to learn about those laws. You know, if we open up Shuhan Aruch, or you open up a book and read five minutes about the greatness of lighting Friday night candles, at least that week, you light it, exciting, you'll be much more inspired than you were the week before. So the way to motivate us, ourselves, is to figure out where we're becoming a little lax and to study those exact laws in order to keep it at the front of our mind to become a little more concerned about it. Torah continues in Pedasha and says, one of the most famous Pesukim talk about the, the goat the goat that they used to bring on Yom Kippur. Actually, there were two goats. A goat in Hebrew is called a sa'ir. Let me tell you the story how the Torah says it was done. One goat was brought as a sacrifice on the Mizbeach. The other goat, they brought it to a mountain, and they threw it off the mountain, and it rolled down the mountain, and it, it died. It turned into to pieces. What's the logic of throwing a, uh, 
an animal that amount doesn't even sound Jewish to do such a thing. So the Torah tells us that the Kohen Gadol would actually place all the sins of the Jewish people, so to speak, on this animal's head, and he would tie a red ribbon around the animal's horn, and he would keep a red ribbon on the wall of the Beit HaMikdash, and when the Sa'id would roll down the mountain, miraculously they would see the red ribbon in the Beit HaMikdash turn white. And that was an indication that God forgave the Jewish people as if all the sins went into this animal and died, and the Jewish people have atonement. But how did they pick the goat? So the Torah tells us. They would make a lottery. They took two goats. And the Kohen would take a box. And he would put two tickets in the box. One ticket said, Lahashim. It's for God. And one said, Khatat. One said, Lahazazim. One said, for the mountain of Azazim. And they would mix the tickets. Not that it's such a big uh, lottery over here. And he would pick it out. And the one that was for Hashem, they put... They mark it, and the month of the mountain, they mark it. So Rabbi Hirsch said once, a very interesting thing. Imagine what's going through the minds if the goats had minds, if the goats were able to think, and if we were able to penetrate what's going through their thought process when this is happening, what do you think they're thinking? Two goats over here. The first goat gets the lottery, it says, Korban. The other goat, it says, he's going to go on the mountain. He has no idea where he's going. But he's looking at his friend. They take him. They slaughter him. They skin him. They light him on fire. So the goat that's remaining alive, he thinks to himself, Hazit, he lost. <laughs> There's a lot of people. He's a winner. There's a loser. Look what happened. I'm alive. They killed him. The Kringle puts him on the out. They put the fire. The goat that remains alive thinks that he made it. And then all of a sudden the Kohen Gadol takes the goat and leaves the Beit HaMikdash and starts walking with him. He says, wow, what did I win over here? A private tour of Jerusalem on Kippur with the Kohen Gadol? Miskin, my friend, what they did to him. Look at Adam walking around over here. All of them are, are cooped up in the synagogue. And I'm able to take a breath of fresh air to walk around the streets of Yerushalayim with no better entourage of people behind me, in front of me. And then they bring him up to a high mountain. He says, she be jinnin. What a view they're giving me over here. They take me to such a place. And he's looking at everybody and he's enjoying everybody. And he thinks to himself, I won. He lost. And then all of a sudden, in a split second, all his friends, all the entourage, they move away from him from behind and they start to push him. And at that last moment, he realizes, Shemai says, I lost. Look what they were doing to me. They set me up. I thought I had a life. They're throwing over mouth to kill me. This is what would be going through the minds of these two goats. And this is why this event takes place on Kippur. Because this was what goes through the minds of Jews. When a secular Jew looks at his life compared to somebody that's religious, the secular Jew thinks, how's he the religious man? The poor religious lady, look what she has to dress like, look what she has to do, look at all the things they're not allowed to speak, the Shabbat, look at the kosher, what a different... Me, Baruch Hashem, I have a good life, I go where I want, I talk what I want, I eat what I want, I dress like I want, I have a very easy life. My poor religious friend, he's always restricted, he can't go, everything's sunset, sunrise, times, things... He's bound by, by, he's in prison. And he thinks his whole life that he won the lottery of life. He thinks that he's right. And the poor man that had to sacrifice for religion. But at the end, at the end of life, our rabbis tell us that right before death, man gets a flash of truth. Just like the Sa'id right before he got thrown off the mountain. And the man right before death, he realizes who lost and who won. Now that we're finishing this world and going to the afterworld, well, I finished my world already. I enjoyed myself already. There's no eternity. However, my friend that sacrificed here, true, it burnt him a little. He was on the Mizbeah of religion. There's no question he had inconveniences. But he paid his dues. 
Now he gets to enjoy for eternity. So therefore, not always the religious person that you think is suffering and losing is the loser. He might be inconvenienced temporarily, like that animal that went on the Mizbeah. But you know where that animal ended up? It ended up next to God. But the poor animal that thought he had a good life and thought he was successful, where does he end up? Into smithereens down a mountain, destroyed Azazel. Therefore, it's a great, great analogy in order not to get fooled, those that are religious, not to be, not to covet the lifestyles of others and say, look, if only we could be like them, there's nothing. That's the goat of Azazel. They're doomed. They're doomed to destruction, God forbid. Therefore, we have to be lucky and thank Borei Olam that thank God for these inconveniences that are really not inconveniences. Somebody once asked me and said, Hakam, I have a fear of committing myself to a lot of these laws and religion and so on. It seems very difficult. Do you have advice for me? So I said, do it. He says, that's my, I came to you for that question. I have a fear of doing it, so tell me exactly advice to allay my fears. I said, do it. He said, explain yourself. I said, I explained it very good. In, in the summer, in Brooklyn also, we have the water coolers. Do you ever try to change the water on a water cooler? It's a very difficult task person has to pick up the, uh, the bottles of water. They must weigh 50 pounds, 60 pounds. It's a, it's a terrible task to do. You lift it on your, your shoulder and you're carrying it and you're sweating and you're bent over. And finally when you pour it on the top, half it falls on the floor so you get it in the thing. And finally you get it. But you have to rest. You have to relax. Because 50 pounds of water was on your shoulder. It was debilitating. But then go to the ocean one day to the Atlantic Ocean, go swimming in the Atlantic Ocean. Man dives in and he's under the water. He has billions of gallons of water on his back. He doesn't feel anything. As a matter of fact, when he's swimming in the Atlantic Ocean, he's relaxed, he feels good. How is it possible? 50 gallons of water, or 50 pounds of water, I should say. 50 pounds was able to crush him. And he had billions of gallons of water of weight was enjoyable, and the explanation is, when you're in it, you don't feel it. When it's away from you, when it's over there, when it's somewhere else, it looks difficult. But when you're swimming in it, you don't feel it. So that's my answer to the person. Rabbi, I'm scared. You know why you're scared? Because you're not in it. When you're not in it, it looks, see, you have problems, it's going to be... But once you jump in, you say, it's not so bad. Oh, Shabbat's enjoyable. Okay, the modesty's not so bad. McVeigh's not so bad. All, all, all these things that you thought because of the propaganda of what people think and what people say and your, your misconceptions. You think it's going to change your life and so on and so forth. I once, I once met a friend. This is supposed to be a Pedashah class. I know it's supposed to be a Pedashah class. And I think it's, there's, there's a point to be made with these two goats. We're going to get back to the Perashah soon. I once met a friend in, when we were in Israel together. Well, I think it was a winter vacation. I was studying in the yeshiva at the time. We had off for a week. I went to Israel. We were in the hotel together. We'd come back from dinner. And we were sitting in the lobby of the hotel. And this friend I haven't seen in a long time sat down next to me and says, You know, I want to ask you a question. You know, you're religious, Torah, learning, all that. How do you, uh, what's, how do you live like this? It's very difficult. I said, I want to ask you a question. His name was Raymond. I said, Raymond, I want to ask you a question. I said, where are you sitting now? And he said, I'm sitting in a hotel, five-star hotel. So where am I sitting now? He said, five-star hotel. I said, you have dinner tonight? I said, yeah, where'd you go for dinner? Well, I went to this restaurant. It's a good restaurant. No, Virginia, ooh, fantastic. I also had it tonight. Where'd you go? Oh, I went to that. Why? Wow, I went to that. What a great restaurant. Better than my restaurant. What are you wearing a suit? Yeah, well, let me see a suit you're wearing. Well, my suit. I'm also wearing a suit. I like my suit. I like my tie. Shoes, okay. So I want to understand exactly. You're saying that I'm learning and religion. We're staying in the same hotel. By the way, I took a plane here. I didn't take a boat to Israel. I'm under, I went, came with the regulars. So we, we, we ate the same. We lived the same. So what's the only difference then between me and you? 
You're an Amma artist. You have no wisdom of the Torah. And I have, a, I have a little, I have a drop of wisdom of the Torah. There's only difference. So did you see that's propaganda that people make it as if those that accept it upon themselves a little religion. Whoa, they're different. They're changed. They're going to suffer. Who's suffering? Anybody suffering? Nobody's suffering. Nobody suffers. Lovely. You're not allowed to suffer, by the way. And anybody that's taking religion in dosages that is causing them to suffer, change your doctor. That's giving the wrong doses. Not supposed to be. It's not supposed to hurt. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be enjoyable. It's supposed to be happy. It's supposed to be flying. It's supposed to be. So therefore. The answer to that is, try it, try it the right way. Like the Sa'id, he thought that he was enjoying, until he was thrown off the mat and he realized that his path was all wrong. So that continues at the end of the Perashah, Perik Yudchech Hasuk He. So that says, famous law of וחי בהם. ושמרתם את חוקותיי ואת משפטיי. אשר יעשה אותם האדם, וחי בהם. אני אשם. תורה says you have to keep the laws. Keep all my statutes. But you have to live by the Torah. וחי בהם. You have to live by the Torah. So the rabbis learn from here that the Torah wants you to live and not die. Vahai by meaning. If somebody comes and tells you, I want you to turn this light on Shabbat, otherwise, God forbid, we're going to kill you. Halakha says, you turn on the light. Why? Because the Torah says, Vahai by him. I gave you the Torah to live, not to die. Except for three sins. There's only three sins in the Torah that we're obligated to give our lives up for. Abu Dazara, idolatry. Murder. Somebody says, kill this man, otherwise I'm going to kill you. And it's just we can't murder. You have to take your life for that. And arayot, immorality. But lest those three sins, every other... The guy tells you, eat hazir. I want you to eat a lobster, otherwise I'm going to kill you. Halakha says, you eat it. Why? The haibahim. You have to live. So I saw from Rabbi Feinstein, Allah Shalom, he points out people misinterpret this pasuk and think that the Torah is more concerned about living than doing the mitzvot. Meaning, you can eat a lobster, that's a sin. But you know what? Torah says life is more important than that. Could there, any, could there be anything more important than mitzvot? We make such an importance, we put such a stress on observance of the mitzvot, and now the Torah is telling you, no, v'chaybahim, your life is more important. So he says, doesn't mean that. Look at what the Targum says. The commentary says right on the side in the interpretation, he's I quote it. V'yadinai di'yabed, follow my laws. Yaton in asha, v'yehebehon, so you shall live l'chaye'alma. In the world to come. Which means the Torah is saying, keep the mitzvot and you have to live. You know where you have to live? You have to live in Olam Abba. And since the only way to get to Olam Abba is by doing mitzvot, therefore the Torah made a call here. Better to f- turn the light on Shabbat once and live in order that you'll be able to keep many more Shabbatot. It's better to make one sin and live in order that you'll be able to continue living and do many mitzvot. So it's not that life in this world is more important than mitzvot. On the contrary, life in the next world is the important thing. Therefore, the Torah says, make sure you stay living in order that you can attain the more important world. V'chai bahem, not here. The high baby is over there in Olam Abba. So better to transgress one in order that you be able to fulfill many. Torah continues in Parashat Kedoshim. Torah says, Ish imo ve'aviv tira'u. We're obligated to respect our parents. Ve'et shabetotai teshmoru. I'm also obligated to keep Shabbat. All the rabbis ask, what's the connection between honoring parents and keep the Shabbat? 
But the Torah puts it in the same pasuk. And the famous Gemara that says, from here we learn that while honoring parents is of paradigm importance, honoring parents is from the most important that's brought in the Torah. However, if a parent would command a son or a child to go against the Torah, Torah says, it's Shabbat, keep the Shabbat, don't listen. The father would say, I want you to go to work on Shabbat. I'm commanding you to go to work on Shabbat. So now you're in a quandary. Well, you have to honor your parents. Father says, but the Torah says you can't work on Shabbat. So who do you listen to? So the Torah says, Ish you must fear your parents. But at the end of the day, it's Shabbat, if it, if there comes a rift between the opinions, God wins. So the Magid Bedubna gives a famous example to bring out this point. Good example, you can tell it over to your children on Shabbat. There was a fellow, a very wealthy man, an innovative man. He invented three different inventions, each one more fascinating than the next. The first one was sort of a screen, like a television, where you're able to program any spot in the world and all of a sudden you see it come up on the screen. Amazing thing. Wherever you want, China, you push a button, you get to see it. And then in China, you're able to move around and see everywhere you want to see. Amazing invention. He then invented a certain type of plane, an airplane, that you're able to fly from one place of the universe to the other. Lightning speed. His third invention was a certain apple that if somebody was sick, and smelt this apple, it would heal them. The father, this man, had three children. When he died, the children started to fight. The Uben says, no, oh, I want the TV. The other guy says, no, I want it. No, you take the plane. No, I want the apple. They're back and forth. Mahlokan broke out within the children and the inheritance. Not an uncommon story. So, they decided, you know what? Let's go to the uh, let's go to the hakam, and the hakam maybe will give us uh, advice. The hakam says, "You know what? Very simple. You have a machloke. Make a lottery. Put three names in the box. Put the three items in the box. So pick it over and get the top. This one got. Oh, what a genius you are, Rabbi! They kiss his hand. Thank you. They were simple people. They thought the hakam was brilliant. They did the lottery. The Uven got the television. Shimon got the airplane, and Levi got the apple." One day, the Uber is watching the television. He's going from country to country, from place to place. He gets to England. In England, he goes to Buckingham Palace. He sees all of a sudden ambulances. He sees police. He sees action. He turns the volume. They tell him the king is sick. Wow, the king is sick. No, he listens close. No, no, no. The king's daughter, the princess, fatally ill. They're bringing doctors. They don't know what to do. So he says, wait, 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 wait. My brother has this apple over here. If we get the apple to them, we'll cure it. How are we going to get there? 20 hours away. Wait, the plane. We'll get the plane. We'll go on the plane. So now, the, the, he goes to the brother. Can we, can we take the plane? Of course you take the plane. We can save the uh, princess. Oh, we got to tell the other brother, Levi, can we use your uh, apple? Come, we'll get on the plane together. They get on the plane together. Three minutes, boom, they get to London. They get to London. They, now, Levi has the apple. They put the a doctor's suit on and the stethoscope because we're not going to let him into the, the palace. He has the apple in his pocket, doesn't say anything. He gets off the plane, they start saying, Oh, Dr. Levi is in town. They make a hype about him. The king says, Bring him, bring him to my uh, palace. All the three brothers walk in. They're his friends, my brothers. He goes into the room. She's out, the princess. He takes out the apple. Nobody's in the room. Everybody out. He takes out the apple. He wants to see if it works. He puts it next to her. She starts to smell. Her complexion starts to come back. He says, Oh, beauty, it works. And now to sketch them a little. He goes out. Well, it's very bad. I don't know what we're going to do. It's going to take a week. I have to see. We'll do. Oh, please. Oh, she had a complexion. He wants to make it a little more dramatic. He goes in a day later, puts a little more. She smells it. She gets better. Ah, finally, she recovers totally. Now the king is so thankful. So he tells the brothers, listen. There's only one way I could thank you. I want one of you to marry my daughter. To become the prince. You decide. So now, all of a sudden, they start fighting. What do you mean? If it wasn't for my television, you wouldn't have seen nothing. What do you mean? I'm the guy. 
The other guy said, what's your television worth? If it wasn't for my plane, he, he wouldn't get this. He would have been dead already. The other guy said, but if it wasn't for the apples, none of this stuff. Mahlouk. He said, you know what? Let's go back to the hacham. He helped us with the inheritance. So they get back on the plane. They land in the rabbi's backyard. They come in. Hacham, please help us. The hacham says, listen, boys, you're not thinking smart. Why don't you ask the princess who she wants to marry? It's not your decision. Wow, what a gaon, what a genius, what a hakan, boss Ido, and he kisses his head. They get on the plane again, they come back and say, listen, we were thinking about it, we thought the princess should decide. So the princess says like this, my dear Uben, there's no question, if it wasn't for your television, there's no way you would have known that I was even sick. Impossible. So I have to thank you a lot. But the truth of the matter is, I don't need this invention anymore. This invention helped me, but it's not necessary for me anymore. I don't need it. Mr. Shimon, if it wasn't for your plane, there's no way you would have got here to cure me. But as thankful as I am to you, your plane doesn't help me anymore. I don't need it. But Mr. Levy, you have this apple. God forbid I should become sick again. How am I going to become healed? You have the, the apple, which is life to me. Therefore, there's no question... While all of you contributed to this success, but the most important contribution was this apple that has the life. The Magid Medubna says from this mashal that the child tells his mother and father, there are three partners in creation. The mother gives part, the color of the eyes and the limbs and the bones, and the father also gives part. It's a combination. But there's a third partner, God gives the soul. So now, who's going to win out when there's an argument? Of course, the son tells the mother and father, thank you for giving me my eyes. But you gave them to me already. Finish. You can't take them back. We can take my eyeballs out. Finish. They're mine. You gave them to me already. Daddy, thank you for giving me the blood and the bones. But finish. You gave them to me already. We can't take them back. I appreciate it. I'm grateful for life. But Borei Olam gave me something that I constantly need and he can take it back. The soul, the neshama, the apple of life. If God takes this back... I'm doomed. Therefore, if it's a choice between listening to a parent, when the parent says, rebel against God, I love you, I need you, but I need God more important, because he gave me the neshama. I'll just conclude and say that I don't want to leave this hanging, this halakha. A child that is hearing this, so, oh, see the rabbi said, you will have to disrespect prayer when it comes to He must ask a rabbi first before he takes this law into his own hands because many times the child thinks that the parent is telling him to do something against the law when it's not. But they use this to say, Oh, I'm allowed to do what I want. So I... Therefore, I say clearly, this cannot be abused, this halakha. We're talking in a black and white case where the father says, Go work on Shabbat. That's clear. But there's a lot of gray areas. That the parent wants one thing for the child, the child wants another, and sometimes this law cannot...